Uh, welcome back for the second session. Um, we are delighted to continue the conversation, hopefully inside the room, not outside. Um, so we set up for a great uh, two-hander session. So I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. Um, and then after that, we'll jump directly to uh, my colleague, Nick, who will introduce Esther. And then we'll take questions um, from both of them at the end of it. So uh, Lucas Chancel is an associate professor at Sciences Po Paris. He's actually visiting Harvard Kennedy School this year. So we were lucky to be able to um, get him to come. His research focuses on global in inequality and environmental policy. And he is the co-director and, and senior economist at the World Inequal Inequality Lab at the Paris School of Economics. So Lucas. Good morning, Good morning um, everybody. Um, I'm, delighted I'm delighted to be here. Um, and would like to, to thank the, the organizers of this, of this great conference. My talk is entitled Addressing Inequality Under Climate Change Issues in Measurement and Policy. And I would like to start with some of the introductory remarks and comments made by Rohini earlier today. I think the, the introductory remarks stressed one of the key achievements of the past um, three decades, which is this reduction of global poverty in, by historic um, um, quantities, uh, by historic numbers, sorry. Um, at the same time, and is this, at, sorry, at the same time, um, despite this strong reduction in global poverty, which is one of these very positive traits of um, globalization of, over the past three decades, economic inequality remains very large globally, and the world is still very far from being flat, as it had been uh, assumed that it would be uh, um, in, in some discourses three or four uh, decades ago. There are uh, still huge uh, numbers of people in extreme poverty who might also live side by side with uh, people with um, very high levels of wealth and affluence. And so what we've also observed over the past three decades is this rise of inequality within major economies in the global north and in the global south. Climate change tends to exacerbate economic inequality trends between countries, and I'll be saying a few words about that. It also affects inequality trends within countries and it makes more challenging the growth of a global middle class. And so the question that I'm going to ask in the coming um, uh, 15 minutes is how to address inequality on the warming planet. And, um, and so to, um, to kickstart this, this discussion, I'm, I'm drawing uh, from a, a few numbers from the World Inequality Report with um, my colleagues, uh, Thomas Piketty, Emmanuel Says, and, and Gabriel Zuckman, where we show here um, the level of income inequality on your left and the level of wealth inequality in the world on the right-hand side of the graph. So at the global level, the top 10% of income earners make about 50% of all incomes, and the bottom 50% of the world distribution make a little less than 10% of all incomes. When it comes to wealth inequality, the picture is uh, more extreme, so to say. The top 10% of wealth owners own close to three quarters of everything there is to own on this planet. And the bottom half of the world distribution owns just 2% of global wealth. Um, so that's the key basic starting point of the discussion that I will try to, uh, to pursue today. Another important fact, I think, is that inequality has been rising in many large uh, countries or economies over the past three or four decades. And here you see the top 10% national income share across a few regions or countries, North America in blue, Europe in green, Russia, Central Asia in purple, China and India in red and yellow on this uh, graph. One of the key insights from this literature on economic inequality is that inequality has been rising, but it has been rising at different speeds. And so this means that there are actually different ways to open up 
to uh, international trade. There are different ways to embrace new technologies. There are, are different wa ways to navigate uh, this uh, changing world and to reduce poverty as well. And I think this is going to be one of the arguments that I will try to make when it comes to uh, tackling climate change and to dealing with the inequality issues associated with uh, climate change. There are different ways in which we can actually do the energy transition. And the question um, here is, how is climate change intersecting with economic inequality, or perhaps more generally with inequalities in human development? And so, um, the discussion on climate change and inequality has been, and this was also uh, uh, stressed in the introduction, for a long time focused on inequality between generations, between now and the future. For uh, some time now, scholars have been starting to focus more on the now problem, inequalities within a generation. And here I'd like to, to borrow some um, word, first bullet point from from Boyce in his book 2002, stressing that pollution is ultimately about winners and losers. Without losers, whether humans or non-humans, alive or yet to be born, without losers, there's no pollution. But there's no pollution either without winners. Otherwise, either it's a trivial problem or uh, it's uh, not going to be uh, sustained for a long time. So it is a distributional matter. It is a distributional issue with winners and losers. Now, when trying to measure it or to analyze um, pollution from an inequality perspective, there might, might be different ways to think about it. There are different dimensions, global scale, national scale, subnational scale, micro level, different metrics monetary, physical, socio-demographic, and different types of um, effects that we might be looking at or dimensions here. Inequality in terms of impacts, who is impacted by climate change, by environmental change, or different ways to contribute to the problem, who is polluting, in what quantities, through which pollutants, but also inequality in capacity to face environmental changes or inequalities in capacity to face policies that address environmental changes. And I think the echo has come back, right? <laughs> Very much, actually. It is growing. <laughs> right. So shall we make a pause to, or shall I continue? So let me just finish this slide uh, by saying that this is a burgeoning field in the social sciences and uh, in which interdisciplinary research is paramount and that's a good news that I think is an exciting news for uh, a diverse audience of, uh, of scholars, of researchers um, like uh, the one here today. One of the key issues is that these analyses these metrics on environmental inequalities, on carbon inequalities, <coughs> pollution inequalities are often missing from official statistics. They're still not quite present in the dashboards used by governments to think about environmental policy or to think about economic and social policy. And now I think that the echo has actually ended. So thank you, thank you very much uh, for, for that. And so what I will try to focus on in the next um, few minutes will draw from um, a few recent papers that are written down here, plus uh, some broader work from the climate inequality literature that we'll also uh, refer to. And the starting point is what um, we call here, with my colleague uh, Philippe Bote and, and Tancred Voiturier, the, the triple climate inequality crisis. So here we try to represent three dimensions of global climate inequality, not necessarily exhaustive, but we think they map a fairly uh, um, good amount of types of inequalities we might want to think about. 
In red, you have the inequality in relative losses associated with climate change. By relative losses here, I mean that we look at income losses of individuals, but we're controlling for average income differences between countries. Okay, so these are relative income losses after having control for differences in average income between countries. And so here we see that the bottom 50% of emitters at the global level, um, in fact, um, make up three quarters of all relative income losses associated with climate change. The second dimension in green is the inequality in emissions, in pollution, some have called this type of inequality an, an inequality in gains. There are losers and there are winners. And so pollution can also be seen, or contributions to CO2 emissions can also be seen as uh, mapping fairly well the gains associated with, uh, with climate change and with uh, this pollution. And so here, the other inequality that is represented here is uh, this one, by which the top 10% of global emitters represent more or less, a little less than 50% of all uh, emissions. And then the third um, category here is the inequality in capacity to finance the transition, or the inequality to face, um, in ability to face uh, climate policies, to be resilient in the face of it. And here, this, uh, this is basically relatively badly proxied, so to say, and I think there's much more work to be done on the matter by basically the inequality in wealth ownership at the global level. level. So basically restating what I was showing before, the top 10% of wealth owners make around three quarters of uh, global uh, wealth. So that is the, that is the general uh, framework of this of this uh, intervention today. I will be looking at these three types of climate inequalities. And for each type, I will review some key findings from, uh, from recent research and discuss some issues associated with uh, the current state of thinking. So unequal losses, um, GDP, uh, Impacts associated with temperature increases have been found to be quite unequally um, spread across the world, with climate change tending to exacerbate inequality between countries. And so tropical and subtropical nations appear to be more impacted by climate change, by the climate change that has already been happening. And this is largely through the channel of uh, agri agricultural productivity impacts, which we've discussed earlier uh, today. Now, um, it is also quite, and so we may want to discuss how, sorry, how these, uh, these estimates are produced, what are the underlying models uh, used to, uh, to produce such estimates. Um, however, this inequality of um, impacts, I think, is, is something that is uh, uh, quite well um, established, as well as the fact that within countries, not just between countries, but within countries, poorest groups tend to be more exposed to environmental changes, to environmental damage, and when environmental damage uh, hits populations, poor, poorest groups are also more vulnerable to it. And so uh, this leads to a, um, climate change leading to higher inequalities within countries as well. And here, Algat and Rosenberg, for instance, have this uh, interesting result looking at household surveys for uh, dozens of uh, countries and simulating uh, shocks associated with environmental damages. They find that the bottom 40% of the distribution loses 70% more than the average due to environmental shocks. So the bottom 40%, the poorest groups of the population, more impacted by the average. By the way, that kind of study here looks at developing countries, but um, the literature has also found that this is not just a developing country characteristic. We also see strong climate inequalities and impacts in rich countries as well. Uh, so it has been shown, for instance, that heat waves are going to hit mm -hmm. 
socio-economically uh, most uh, deprived group more than the average, for instance. And here I'm just referring to this uh, work by Obradovich and co-authors, where uh, they look at differences between low-income, high-income women, men, individuals, when it comes to the effect of heat exposure on uh, the probability of reporting mental health issues. And so this is also maybe an area where more work can be done to uh, make such results even more granular and more precise, but there's a strong case here of intersection between uh, gender, class, and climate inequalities. Now, some issues in this, uh, in this uh, inequality of losses uh, stream of the literature, I think, is that standard approaches to measuring climate risk or climate impact can lead to mistargeting. So here, what this global map shows is the economic value at risk of flooding across the world measured in US dollar purchase and power parity. And so you see some form of distribution of these losses across the globe. Uh, now, when the question you're gonna ask might be a question of what's the number of people in poverty that are affected, the map might look pretty radically different here. So here, this is the population share, which is below a dollar uh, 1.9 poverty threshold, and which is also at flood risk. So we have a very different representation of what this inequality is about. So I think that uh, what I've been trying to discuss here is that um, there's this need for very granular data. We've been looking at that earlier today, and I think there is a strong evolution in uh, recent work here, also mobilizing uh, large-scale large uh, satellite imagery uh, to, to look at these issues. Um, but there's also a need for the use of combination of monetary and non-monetary metrics to understand these inequalities. And so this is, again, this strong call for uh, even more interdisciplinary research on the matter. Uh, the challenges ahead, I think, again, connecting with some of the discussion earlier today, is how to produce real-time estimates, how to produce forecasts that can be used by policy to target their social policy measures, for instance, to anticipate climate shocks and their impacts, and also how to think about and how to measure the joint distribution of consumption, of income and capital, and how these are impacted by uh, climate change. And this is something which I think uh, still quite a bit of work uh, can be done. It's already quite difficult to measure the consumption of income, capital, and consumption jointly. And it's even more complex to uh, simulate or to uh, estimate how climate change might affect these uh, distributions. Now let me look at the inequality of contributions. So um, the inequality of contributions, so that was my green bars here. The first way to look at the problem is really the, this historical inequality of contributions here. So over 1850 to 2020, uh, North America and, and Europe uh, represented about half of all emissions and so the key question is how to split the remaining budget across countries and across individuals, but this first big dimension of uh, inequality of contributions. Another way to look at this is to look at the inequality in average contributions across uh, the world. So global average uh, GHG emissions per capita, um, around six, six tons. Uh, per person uh, in 2019, with Sub-Saharan Africa around 1.6 tons per person per year on average, and North America a little more than 20 tons per person per year on average. Um, now, sorry, one of the big questions is then how are we going to split this, these averages across the distribution? So not looking just as, at averages, but looking at the inequality between individuals. There are many different ways to do it. The bottom line I'd like to, to say is, in this graph, these are results for bottom 50%, middle 40%, top 10, top 1%. Um, so these are the share in total emissions, the results from different studies. The bottom line is that these various studies, mobilizing different types of methodologies, seem to come up with relatively similar numbers. And what are these numbers? The top 
of the distribution of income earners or, cons or consumers or emitters represent more or less 45% of all emissions. And the bottom half of the world population emits between 7% 7, 7 and 15% of the total. So that's a relatively uh, standard result in this uh, literature. Another uh, result, um, this one from one specific study, and uh, with all due respect for uh, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that was referred to earlier, um, in fact, what we see here is that poverty in itself is not the big chunk of the problem at the global level when it comes to uh, CO2 emissions here, bottom 50% of the world population, less than 10% of emissions, but even the eradication of extreme poverty itself would not represent, according to Bruckner and co-author, such a big uh, increase in uh, overall emissions. So this is top 1% emissions compared with emissions required to eradicate $1.9 or $3.2 uh, uh, poverty. So the big question is, the growth of the middle class. It is not the eradication of uh, extreme poverty. Now, another result from this literature, I think, is uh, that there has been somewhat of a big shift in the relative importance of between versus within country carbon inequality over the past four decades. So this is a tile index decomposition of the global inequality in individual carbon emissions. And so according to these results, uh, in the early 1990s, a little more than 60% of global inequality is due to between country differences, so to average differences between China and US Europe, uh, for instance. This inequality has been reducing over time, and now we are in a world where most of the um, inequality most of global carbon inequality is due to within country differences. This doesn't mean that there aren't big differences in average emission levels between regions. And I refer to one of the earlier graphs I've presented, but it means that on top of this, we're now in a world where there's also quite a big amount of inequalities within countries. Um, let me, in the interest of time, so two minutes, three minutes, all right, in the interest of time, just maybe flagging some uh, key issues in this, uh, in this literature on the attribution of emissions to individuals. It is quite straightforward to attribute direct emissions to individuals or to households. So think about the carbon that you emit when you use your, uh, your car that uses gasoline. Or think about the emissions from your gas heater, for instance. That's really easy to, to attribute to individuals. When it comes to attributing all emissions within, uh, that are associated with production processes to individuals, it's more complicated. One of the, uh, the IPCC gives basically two criterions to do so. One is that of exclusivity. You don't want to count the same ton, ton of carbon twice for two different actors. But also, of, you need to be comprehensive. So you want to count direct and also indirect emissions. And to do this in a systematic framework uh, at the level of a country as a whole, and even more at the level of the world, is quite challenging. And so the standard approach to that has been to distribute all emissions to consumers using input-output tables, so trade tables uh, connected with uh, uh, pollution data, and to allocate all these emissions to consumers. And I think that's a, a, a good way to proceed. At the same time, this um, tends to miss the role of savings, the role of investors uh, in, uh, in driving emissions or in driving decarbonization. This tends to omit the fact that as consumers, we sometimes have limited information, limited agency. And so um, this approach to measuring emissions solely focused on consumer is actually uh, in some ways limited. And just to give you an insight of uh, of what I'm trying to say here, this is the distribution of carbon footprint in the US uh, in 2019. That's a consumer 
perspective, full population a little more than 20 tons per person per year. The top 10% of the population here is a little above 50 tons per person per year. Now, if I'm doing the same thing, so attributing US emissions to US individuals, if I'm attributing direct emissions again to those who are responsible for these direct emissions, but if I'm attributing emissions from production processes in a different way, not to the final consumers of goods, but to the owners of the industries that pollute, this is the kind of picture that I would have. The top 10% uh, in, that, in that case um, emits 100 tons of CO2 per person per year, so a factor two different. So this is, and I'll skip all this in the interest of time, just to say that uh, the consumption approach has been very useful to think about emissions responsibility and inequality, but it might be quite limited, and better measuring em emissions associated with wealth is key. This might uh, lead us to having other new insights of how to think about the incidence of carbon taxes and of regulations. And I will skip the final part, which was really about this uh, third dimension here, the capacity to finance, maybe just by saying that we might think from this graph that this is essentially a global north versus a global south issue. Capital is in the north and relative losses are in the south. However, there are also very large wealth inequalities in each region of the world. So even in Europe, which is a relatively equal region in this world, uh, the bottom 50% of the population owns less than 5% uh, of uh, wealth. So this has implications in how we're going to think about bridging the global climate finance gap. Who should bridge this gap? Private actors? public actors, uh, how to think about that in a context of strong, relatively strong inequalities, and how to think about that in a context where the investments we make today are not only going to determine the ecological state of the world in the future, but also contribute to shape economic inequalities in the decades to come. Thank you very much for your attention. So, uh, wonderful. Um, thank you for this um, introduction and then sort of tour of the facts on climate inequality, in particular this focus on bridging the gap. So we're now going to kind of turn the attention um, in the conference towards exactly that. Uh, what can governments and markets do to address some of the problems that we've seen in these first two sessions? Um, and to kick that off, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Esther Duflo. Uh, Professor Duflo is the Abdul Latif Jamil Professor of Development Economics and Poverty Alleviation in the Department of Economics at MIT. Uh, she's the co-founder and co-director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, uh, which really sort of led uh, the innovation of using randomized experiments, as we saw in the first session, in development economics. And her own research has spanned uh, an incredible range of topics within development, from credit and finance uh, to education and health, governance, um, inequality, uh, and environment as well, uh, as well as contributions to empirical methods. So uh, this is really a remarkable um, set of work, and it's been recognized broadly, in, including with the inaugural 2008 BBVA Frontiers of Knowledge Award and the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics. So it's a great pleasure. Please welcome Professor Duflo. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you so much. Um, and by uh, way of preliminary, I feel a bit like, like an interloper. I have done some work on environment uh, with Nick, with Roni, uh, uh, among others, but it's been some time. And uh, and what I'm going to talk about today involves almost no uh, randomized control trial, although it has some plug for them. Uh, so I, I kind of uh, one of these uh, older people who uh, uh, use <laughs> their, uh, their previous work to justify uh, shouting their mouth about everything. So I apologize for that, but uh, um, uh, a lot of what I'm going to say are things that you guys uh, know. Uh, 
Uh, but maybe we, that's also giving kind of a way of packaging it for the rest of the world, which might also be helpful. And some of you represent the rest of the world, so you can be my test audience. Uh, so, oops, that's not the, yes, that's the one I want. I want to start with John Kerry. Uh, so this is uh, kind of what we have to, uh, when we, you know, motivated by uh, Lucas' talk or the talk this uh, morning, you know, earlier this morning, we might think that, you know, one of the key questions we have to address is what is our response, what is the responsibility of the rich world vis-a-vis -vis the poor part of the world or rich citizen vis-a-vis -a, -vis a poor citizen. And uh, it doesn't start very well because uh, the climate envoy of the U.S. says that, uh, you know, sets the stage in June by uh, testifying in front of Congress that the U.S. under no circumstances will pay climate reparations. So uh, you would think that's not a very good, it is kind of a pretty clear way to start the negotiations uh, for um, uh, kind of the, the sharing of the, uh, both the mitigation of climate change moving forward and uh, the cost of the adaptation uh, that has already happening. Uh, but I think it is very important to just take that as a given because I think it is true. The U.S. will, under no circumstance, bear reparation. So I think it's just as a positive matter, at a normative ma uh, level, we, of course, should, uh, you might disagree. At a positive level, I think it's helpful to take that under advisement and say this is not happening. But of course, it's not just about past responsibility. So it's not just about uh, reparations, because as Lucas told us, the, the emissions responsible for climate change are mainly due uh, to the current behavior of rich citizens, most of which, although not all of which, are in rich countries. Uh, I plan to spend very little time on this because uh, uh, I knew that Lucas was before me, uh, but I think one point that was not, he didn't highlight as much as he does in, uh, in, in most of his work, and which is really essential to remind people, although I do know it, uh, in this, uh, you know, the second line after the U.S. will pay reparation under no circumstances is usually, well, yes, historically it was us, but now look at China. They are, in, they, they are, they are the ones, they are the problem. So unless China uh, uh, fixes their uh, uh, emission problem, then, you know, there is nothing we, you know, the, it's going to be limited what can be done. You hear a lot of that in Europe, which is kind of self-righteous feeling that we're already kind of ahead in the, in the combat. So yes, you know, but you know, uh, China and then the US, of course, and then India, they are the ones who are emitting already a lot and more and more. So frankly, this is to them, towards them that you have to uh, 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 focus your attention. Uh, but of course, uh, um, China and India are producing a lot of goods that are then consumed uh, uh, in the rest of the world. And China and India are net CO2 exporters, and the USA is a very big importer, and so is Europe. Uh, so in other words, when we're thinking about using this input-output tables to think about uh, the full carbon footprint of a person, we need to take into account uh, when they drive their electric car, uh, they are, uh, the, the full carbon footprint of someone is whatever went to produce said electric car. You all know that. This is so obvious that Lucas didn't remind uh, us that this is how we are trying to, uh, that it needs to be com compu computed, but that's not the, 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 the headline numbers uh, when we think about emission that, that that uh, come to the news, it's not the consumption emission, let alone the wealth emission, uh, it's just the emission. <laughs> so, so I think the first thing is to remind that. It's a lot of work, obviously, to do properly, uh, but as uh, Luca emphasized, uh, many people have done it, several, not many, but several groups have done it, and in particular, uh, he cited Bruckner and himself. The methodologies are really different to arrive at very similar results. Both of them have a lot of assumptions. You might quibble with all of the assumptions, but the fact that they lead to very similar results is encouraging. Um, uh, Lucas was a bit more subtle in describing his own results than I will be, but I like to remind them by this 1050 rule. 10% of the highest polluters worldwide are responsible for almost 50, for about 50%, almost 50% of global emission. And conversely, 50% of the lowest polluters are responsible for about 10% of global emission. It didn't have to be that way. In fact, it's not exactly uh, that way, uh, but it's easy to, to remember. 
uh, since we have uh, Bruckner, uh, 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 the Bruckner is the World Bank that Tim uh, found very similar results, uh, and they have a nice uh, map, so I thought I, I, I would switch to them. Uh, and then uh, when you look at where these people are located, it is true that there is uh, rich people in, uh, who, who emit a lot in India and China, in the Middle East also, but it, is, it tends to be the case that uh, high polluters mainly live in rich countries. Um, so this is the map of the carbon footprint, and of course the Sahel region of Africa that we uh, uh, heard about uh, this morning is entirely uh, blue, uh, while the U.S. is, is bright red. And uh, with that notion of emission, uh, Europe is actually kind of uh, orangish, whereas it would look better if we didn't include uh, consumption, uh, if, we, if, we, if we didn't include kind of imputed emission from what we consume. Uh, this is something Lucas has already said, which is, uh, which is quite important. Uh, I, I'll show you a little bit later, the, uh, but again, it was mentioned this morning, and, and you will know that there is a lot of uh, kind of emphasis on mitigation effort in poor countries. And this idea that there would be a trade-off between uh, 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 reducing poverty and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and fighting uh, cli and avoiding making climate change worse. But first order, because people in Africa emit almost nothing, even if their income were to double, that would really not make a big difference. So it's kind of a non-discussion to have. And for a non-discussion, it has a lot of place in the public discussion. Uh, so one summary of this, uh, of this, of this uh, first discussion. So Lucas had an even a smaller number, but uh, so the way I read this is that eradicating extreme poverty, so making nobody lives under $2 a day, would increase emissions by only 2%. Uh, this probably represents you know, a tiny amount, a tiny fraction of, of what the richest people in the world consume. So we can kind of forget that trade-off in the sense that first order, uh, um, first of all, uh, poor people are extremely poor <laughs> and need to be less poor. Now, second of all, even if we are only were worrying about climate, uh, of course, being, uh, being poor is... It, pretty bad deal to, uh, to be protected against climate. The first order way of adapting to climate change is to have a bit more money so that you can, you don't have to work when it's very hot, so you can adapt your production and so on and so forth. So that is kind of the first point I wanted to make. The second point is, uh, again, as Lucas already said, the cost of climate change are going to be felt in the poor part of the world. He emphasized income, and I want to emphasize mortality from the work by you know, people in this room at uh, Global Impact Lab. But the first, the first order point, of course, poor countries are in places that are already hard. Uh, so this is temperature today. Uh, and therefore, even though, you know, suppose the, the earth warms by two degrees, it's not going to be two degrees absolutely everywhere, but just to simplify, imagine that's the case. If you're in a place where there are already many very hot days, then you're going to get more of those hot days. Uh, and then of course, the impact of uh, temperature on the human body's ability to uh, thrive and then to survive is not linear. In particular, you know, above 30, 32, in particular, if it's a little bit humid on top of that, is where it becomes uh, just not very congenial for, for human life. And you're going to see more of those hot days in poor countries. Uh, uh, already we see them more today. I realize that uh, I, I, I'm keeping under advisement from this morning using the fact that it's happening today already. But, you know, this is 2050, soon enough. We are going to get more of the hot days. I should note this is uh, um, the, the north of Latin America is also to be uh, it kind of gets very red in these places, and by I think I skipped uh, one slide. Well, by 2000, it's even more hot days, and you see a huge concentration of the number of very hot days uh, uh, in uh, places that are very poor, in particular uh, sub-Saharan Africa, but also Pakistan. Uh, and uh, uh, the northeast of Brazil, for example. The second point, also from uh, uh, Tara Carlton and others, uh, sh uh, um, 
this uh, big, uh, great group of people at uh, Chicago looking at, and kind of uh, a lot of people they work with all, all over, have used historical data to uh, uh, try and compute the, the, the cost, again, in terms of, uh, of human mortality of an extra hot days. So what you can do is to say, well, it's been, you know, in the past, around the climate, there is variation from year to year. Take a particular district in India where there are more hot days, uh, do more people die compared to a very similar district where in this particular year, there are fewer hot days. So that's, we can use this historical data to give us an idea of the impact of temperature and mortality. I should say, this is really variation around business as usual. It doesn't include any of the disaster that we're going to get to uh, as well. Flooding uh, and this type, uh, you know, fire, this type of stuff. It's just temperature. So this is uh, very much lower bound, but we're going to st stick with that for the moment. And uh, so what, they, what they're uh, do, doing in their QJE paper is to look at uh, a bunch of microregions. There are fewer than that. There is a bit of interpolation involved in that. And then separating countries by uh, cold countries, hot countries, medium temperate countries, and then poor country, rich country, uh, uh, medium countries. And two things. First of all, in places that are uh, very uh, cold, uh, when it gets hot suddenly, a lot of people die because the places are not uh, used to, to that. So uh, a few, now almost a decade ago, there was a massive heat wave in France, and many, many people died, because we were so unprepared. In the subsequent heat wave, we did much better, because we kind of knew what to do with that, and visit the old people, and bring them to cinemas or museum, or so on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that in places which are poor, uh, uh, mortality is much higher of, for hot days, and this is because uh, you don't have you, poor people tend to work outside. Uh, poor people uh, do not have air conditioning, so you take a, a very hot day in Texas, and people go from their air conditioning home into their air conditioning car into their air conditioning office, and they don't die. But you very very hot day in Pakistan, and then uh, people are uh, 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 working in the heat, and they have heat stroke, and they die. So when you combine all of that, so this is what this graph summarizes. When you combine all of that, you get these maps, which is the mortality effect of a particular hot day, you know, one more hot day, 35 degrees. So of course, in you know, in Greenland, it would be very uh, people. Uh, if there were people in Greenland, they would die when it's very hot. But there are not going to be very many hot days in Greenland. Uh, but then in sub-Saharan Africa, where we already see that there would be a lot of hot days, then a lot of people will die too. Uh, because, uh, because they are poor. So when you combine the fact that... Uh, uh, oops. I'm not doing very well with the slide. Yes, that's the one one. When you combine the two, uh, you, the fact that there will be more hot days in uh, poor places that are already poor, and these hot days will create more uh, death, uh, you get this map, uh, also from that same QGE paper, which is by 2100, uh, so maybe it's too far in the future for us to think, because I think we probably could do something already like that today. But it's very striking, which is you have this big red blotch uh, in, in uh, basically uh, uh, Kelsey's uh, uh, field work, uh, the whole the Sahel region of Africa, but also uh, the north of, uh, of, of South Asia. And then most of the OECD is blue, which means that climate change will actually save, save lives in, uh, in rich countries. So just so you don't get the message that you, we have no, nothing to worry about in rich countries, this is just temperature, that there is all these other things. There will be damage in rich countries. But from temperature alone, actually, if you just look at the mortality impact of temperature, the impact will be concentrated in poor countries. So the estimate is that in a business as usual scenario, the RCP 8.5, there would be 73 extra deaths per 100,000 people uh, by 2100. So, and of course, in the middle, we'll walk through that, um, exclusively in poor countries. And that's more than all of the uh, deaths from infectious diseases today. So it's like, you know, take, uh, all of HIV, uh, tuberculosis, etc. that's going to be more than that. 
Uh, so this makes for, in a sense, I'm just repeating in different ways what Lucas said, but this makes it for very thorny political issues. Because first order, in the next many years, uh, the problems are going to be uh, felt in, in poor countries, uh, at least the kind of first problem of being alive. <laughs> But the principal margin of actions are in the south because this is where people are, are uh, so in the north, sorry, because this is where uh, 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 the, the highest emitters are located. Uh, so is it the case that until now we've uh, displayed a great capacity to deal with this kind of uh, issue? That's a bit of a rhetorical question. Uh, because we have the recent experience of COVID, which was a problem which, in a sense, come from the north and was exported to the south, where it came originally from China. But it's not that there was even that much COVID in Africa, but we told them you have to lock down your economy, right? Um, so this was this problem that was at least a global problem. And there were really two, two dimensions when, uh, where uh, we um, the kind of the world could have globally acted. One was uh, financial transfers and the other was vaccines. Uh, on financial transfers, uh, there was almost no increase in bilateral or multilateral fund flows towards the poor countries. So while uh, the rich world was uh, doing whatever it takes to get out of it, so the, the countries in the rich world, this is a map from the IMF about how much uh, a country spent in fiscal stimulus measures, so the countries uh, in the uh, rich world spend about 27% of their GDP in uh, fiscal stimulus measures. Uh, the poorest country in the world spend 2% of their GDP in uh, fiscal stimulus measures. And of course, the GDP is much smaller. So basically, the smaller countries weren't able to, uh, to do much to help their, uh, uh, their citizens adjust, which led to this increase in poverty in, uh, in poor countries, which had no equivalent in richer countries. And uh, it would really have cost almost nothing. It would have hardly registered to uh, borrow a little more on top of the trillions we were borrowing anyways to bring Togo at 27% of their GDP because the GDP of Togo is so small that uh, this would, you know, we would kind of hardly have seen the difference. But this didn't happen at all. Uh, so that's the first point. The second case, of course, which was widely publicized is the, the, the inability to, uh, to secure vaccine early uh, in the pandemic for the poor countries, despite having an institution to do that, which was uh, COVAX, which was set up to do that and proceeded to be unable to buy doses because the rich countries had been hold, holding them. So when this was happening, I, uh, my uh, take on that was like, oh, wow, it's pretty bad. First of all, it's pretty bad. And second of all, it really sends a terrible signal about the ability of the world to uh, share uh, solutions to, to problems. And it's going to be very costly for climate change moving forward. And of course, I didn't know about Ukraine yet, but I think we've seen the direct consequences, for example, in African countries' refusal to, uh, to, to engage very much uh, with uh, what uh, uh, Europe or the US had to say on Ukraine. Uh, it is, uh, at the moment, uh, um, seems to be a bit of a stand, standstill in the, at least under pressure, the, the world getting together to, uh, to uh, uh, share uh, solutions and problems. That's a, uh, uh, so where are we after many, many cops? Um, so that's a, maybe an unfair characterization of where we are. Uh, not enough uh, money uh, going towards... Uh, low- and middle-income countries, the commitments are too weak, and they are not carried out or they are not renewed. Uh, there was a $100 billion pledge in, uh, uh, COP, uh, uh, in uh, Copenhagen many, many years ago, which was never fulfilled. I'll show you slides in a minute. And to the extent that, they spent, that money was sent towards developing countries, it's mostly loans and mostly mitigation, which is nice enough, but that's kind of neither here nor there vis-à-vis uh, uh, the, the, the cost that we are uh, implying. Then there was a COP27 reparation fund. It came without financing. Then there was a bit of a debt clock. Maybe it was dead on arrival. It, it, as it turns out, not almost as timely as the social cost of carbon. On November 6, uh, a basic agreement to have a fund hosted at the World Bank as an interim trustee was reached. But uh, at the behest of the U.S., 
uh, the, there is no obligation for anybody to contribute to such fund. Uh, so the agreement encourages, but to, does not oblige all countries to contribute uh, to the fund. So the developing countries are very, ups, the low-income low countries are very upset because the fund is in the World Bank, and the, rich, the, the, the U.S. Uh, made sure that nobody really had to contribute to it. So it it's, seems that there is a bit of work to uh, to continue to uh, uh, to work on that. Um, I'll stay at the, on, on, so this is what has happened since the COP, uh, since the, the commitment in 2015. So this is the amount of money, sorry, the slides are in French for some reason. This is the, the, the uh, uh, what was sent, what was spent, uh, so less than 100 billion, but more importantly, it is mostly loans and it's mostly mitigation. So basically we are lending money to poor countries to undertake investments that are going to help reducing the carbon in the atmosphere for everyone. So it doesn't seem that it's addressing the issue of the, the cost that we are. So we make a few points before getting to, uh, to, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to the uh, kind of proposal. The first one is you cannot, we cannot tackle climate change collectively without uh, tackling redistribution across countries. Uh, that's both a kind of a normative uh, point of view and also a positive uh, uh, position because, as you said, currently the best way to not die from hot, water, uh, hot weather is to be uh, rich. So no adaptation funds is going to mean uh, less mitigation. Uh, in the absence of funds for adaptation, what country wants is to become rich as fast as, as fast as possible and also to use as much uh, energy as possible. Uh, if you look at the energy demand that is uh, estimated uh, from now between 2100, there's going to be a huge increase in energy demand uh, uh, for countries that are hotter and have the you know, middle-income countries that have the ability to purchase air conditioning and to uh, connect everyone to energy. This is India, China, etc. India is, is projected to have an increase in 150% percent almost in energy demand. And they want to do that like, as quickly as possible, uh, so if it, takes, if it is charcoal, so be it. So um, that kind of there is this clear dilemma for uh, emerging markets. Um, say Equator wants money. It would like to not drill the Amazon, but if nobody gives them money to do it, they will drill the Amazon. India wants uh, uh, energy, and therefore at the COP26, the Glasgow at the very end, they decided not to sign the... Uh, you can know, side with China to not sign the, the, the pledge to uh, win themselves or charcoal, and they say it's very nice, but uh, the problem is we have to, uh, we, you know, the real the thing that this summer is like real climate was climate injustice. So that's the first point. The second point is you cannot cl uh, tackle climate change without tackling redistribution within countries. Again, that's the normative point, the one that Luca made. It's also a positive point. Uh, because when you try to do something that is uh, going to address climate change, there are going to be winners and losers. And unless the losers are not pretty convinced that they are going to make, make whole, then it's just not going to happen. So in, uh, in France, uh, the, 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 we had this yellow jacket protest uh, where the people protested with their yellow jacket. And what prompted it was an effort to uh, have a carbon tax on gasoline and uh, that carbon tax was removed after about half a day. <laughs> but and then the, the protest continued. But this is what launched it. And what it said on the jacket is uh, money for uh, cl fighting climate change is, in, is to be found in fiscal paradise, not in the pocket of the proletariat. Uh, so this, this, but this is very strong. And that's true both for carbon tax, but any regulation as well. So people don't want to abandon their old car because they still need to travel and, and so on. Uh, in poor countries, in uh, poorer countries, it's a bit the same thing. Uh, so that's an example for, uh, so in, in, in India, as uh, uh, Nick has studied intensively, there is free power to, uh, uh, to farmers, which is a problem for climate change. It's even more immediate problem for uh, overuse of, of water. But all the attempts to uh, 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 remove the subsidies or lower the subsidies and replace them with, say, cash, has really, have been uh, really struggled in the face of very, very strong farmer opposition. 
and so we did here they call it like midsummer madness. So people basically do not trust that this is something you, you can do. So if we take into account these two things, this is where I come to the more uh, kind of going on the limb, it seems that the world needs to manage to commit now to a mechanism to raise money for a fund, which could be the loss and recovery fund, which would be designed to low-income countries and within that to low-income citizens. It needs to be fair, uh, both nationally and internationally. It needs to be permanent because uh, we have already showed that we cannot renegotiate. <laughs> we have to have rules, otherwise it's not happening. And ideally, provide some incentive to reduce pollution along, along the way, because otherwise there is this, you know, the, the worst case scenario would be one where uh, people in rich countries feel they are now paying for their emission, and therefore they can continue to uh, emit peacefully because there is no... Um, so how much uh, uh, should it, so uh, what I want to do in my last uh, few minutes is say how much money is needed, where we can find it, and how we would spend it. So how much money is needed? Uh, so the way, uh, it's a bit of a choose your own adventure here, but this is the calculation I made, very simple. I'm taking the Carlton uh, at, uh, and at all estimate of $37 of damage per ton just from loss of life. So this is not the total social cost of carbon. This is just the cost uh, that transit from the, you know, if more people die, we lose the, all these uh, statistical lives. They have a number, uh, this, and therefore each ton costs us, in terms of loss of life, $37. Then you take the consumption emission, not the actual, not the production emission, but the consumption emission. If, we, if that changes, this number changes, that can change. Add them up for US and Europe, multiply by 37, and you get to about $500 billion. So unfortunately, this turns out to be also the cost that people say we need to spend on energy transition, so that creates confusion, because everybody wants to raise $500 billion. But it has, not, it has nothing to do with it. This is, this is not for transition. This is what we owe uh, uh, today, what we owe every year to the poor countries uh, from the fact that we are killing them. So that's, that's about, so that's a lot of money. Just for comparison, U.S. total foreign aid is $56 billion, so we are not in the same ballpark. Now, how will we find it? So pe pe the number of, this, of options have been uh, discussed, uh, including uh, air passenger, ticket levy, uh, uh, IMO, uh, um, transit like a uh, ship uh, levy, and so on. Um, my uh, um, proposal, uh, so I want to p talk about one little proposal that I have and also uh, something that uh, Gabriel Zuckman's outfit, the EU Tax Ob Observatory, came up with. Uh, their report came out uh, 25 October of this, this year, very recent. So I just want to add that as well. Uh, so in, uh, so th my, my proposal is, uh, the reason why I propose this is that I think it would be feasible. I, I think it's not crazy to think that it could happen. Because in a, so this is a minimum tax on uh, large corporations. So in October 2021, 137 countries and jurisdictions agreed to implement uh, a major reform in the international corporate tax system, uh, a global uh, minimum tax of 15% of the profits of the largest multinational companies. Um, so... The way it works, there are two pillars, but pillar two is the one that raises uh, monies. So, for example, if a German company pays 10% of their profits on Singapore, Germany will collect the extra 5%, so everyone gets to, uh, gets to 15. Um, so my proposal for this is to uh, and just add to that, and the EU tax uh, uh, observatory uh, helpfully allows you to... Uh, to uh, put your numbers, you know, how much you want to raise. They have simulators for it. So if the original plan was 25%, just to see that minimum. Then it, through various negotiations, went back down to 15%. Suppose we go back to 20, so you add 5%. Uh, that's uh, uh, 400 billion euros right there. Suppose you add 3%, that's 300 uh, billion, billion euros. Um, if uh, the U.S. didn't want to do that, which is plausible given that they didn't them ratifying the first one, uh, the Europe only uh, could do it uh, uh, with two, and raise 200 billion by adding, by adding 
So the Europe, EU could, could do a first... Uh, a first uh, then if we take the, the proposal that uh, came out in the EU tax observatory, which is not about climate, it's about you know, just taxing people in general, they, uh, take the, they, propose, they, they calculate the revenue potential of a minimum tax of 2% on the wealth of billionaires in 2023. It's 3,000 people in the world, so it's not very many. Uh, two percent wealth tax. It's 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 good to think about it as a forty percent income tax on the interest that generated because uh, rich people have very good return on the labor, on the stock market. So let's say they make about five percent, uh, which is goes and tax because most of it is kind of reinvested and so on. If you take about half of the five percent, that corresponds to about two percent. So I think of a two percent wealth tax not as a, oh we have to. Uh, tax the rich above and beyond 2% wealth tax as, well, that's kind of a way of bringing them to the type of marginal tax rate that we pay. Uh, um, so if you did that, uh, you could raise uh, 258 billion uh, per year. Uh, and today we're already raising some money from them, so it's an extra 200. So combine the 3% extra on the corporation plus this 2% tax rate, and we're getting to, five, oops, we're getting to 500 billion uh, relatively uh, plausible. Even if Russia didn't want to participate, we still would get 200. So uh, there is a number of issues. <laughs> First of all, the OECD thing is, you know, it's, it's still in, in, in the making. The second big problem is that in the original proposal, the country that enforced the tax keep it. So they have a strong incentive to do it, whereas here I would like to take this money and, and, and put it to that fund. Um, so the first problem is, so is it feasible? Well, uh, the, the, what I had, is it could be done unilaterally, unilaterally by Europe, or really by any country or group of country, by adding a, a tariff, basically, to the goods that come to, from countries that are not taxing at the same level. It's not great, economists do not like tariff, but in, in, in some sense, the IRA in the US is also uh, has a lot of protectionist elements, so maybe, maybe the world is moving in a direction where politically, at a positive level, it's feasible. So we don't have to wait for everybody to agree. We can, for the EU, for example, could, dis, could do the first step. For the second issue that it goes to other people and would people agree and so on. So first of all, it's already the case for whatever contribution we send to the IMF or to the, or to the World Bank. Second of all, there is very interesting uh, work by Adrien Fabre uh, and then uh, people that I don't know their first name, Dwen and Matao, looking at, uh, uh, they have a panel of uh, 40,000 people uh, that they uh, interview on various issues re re regarding climate change. And they have tremendous amount of support uh, for a global wealth tax on millionaires. The people, to, uh, uh, and then, um, so 67, uh, in every country, in, uh, it's 67% or more, uh, but the, on average it's more, I'll show you in a, in a moment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then when people, so people are asked whether they would be in favor of a wealth tax on millionaires, they are in general quite favorable, even though they don't like taxes in general. So this is, uh, and, and then when they are asked whether some of this money should go toward the, the poor, uh, um, and in about, people say that about a third of that should go to low-income countries. And I should say it's a tax on millionaire, not billionaire. So you would think that maybe a tax on billionaire would be even more favorable. Still from that paper, you can look the, the, uh, the support for uh, various proposals that are global proposals. Uh, and you can see that, where is the one that I'm looking for? Um, uh, there is a, a, a fair amount of support for uh, payment from high income country to low income country. Um, and uh, Next national, uh, the global tax on, on millionaire funding low-income country, which is basically the, the one I'm proposing, as uh, you know, the U.S. is the lowest support with 69 percent, but then Europe is 84 percent support, uh, and within Europe you see these this different countries. So there is actually a fair amount of popular support for for something like that, which doesn't mean um, plenty of ideas have popular support and they don't happen anyway, but at least it's not going necessarily against the grain. Oops. <laughs> 
Um, then the, suppose that that money is raised. The next, uh, oh yeah, yeah, the third issue is it, there is no connection to climate change. So this, I think, we could improve. We could we could improve that. Right now, I don't think we have a great measure of uh, uh, of carbon footprint of farms. But if we improve the accounting of carbon footprint of farms, and now that we have the right uh, social cost of carbon, we can. Uh, kind of that corporation, this corporation tax could have a carbon tax flavor to them. And unlike the carbon tax that are in general unpopular, a carbon tax which is, you know, a, a, basically a, maybe a rebate for firms that are uh, virtuous uh, from the minimum in, income tax would uh, work well. So you could have incentive uh, built into the system. Uh, companies that improve their carbon footprint could see their liability reduced. That would be perhaps uh, acceptable. Of course, the fact that taxing, taxing the very, very rich because they consume more and therefore emit more is in itself uh, uh, goes in the right direction from, climate change, from a carbon tax point of view. Okay, so now that I have my 500 billion, what do we, uh, what do, we do with it? How to spend it? Uh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a very, very difficult uh, a debate and very angry debate in the loss and, uh, uh, for the loss and uh, damage fund that was proposed at the last COP and it almost scuttled. You know, a few weeks ago there was a, a, a political stalemate about that thing. Maybe they would not even propose it at the next COP. And the issue was very much like where would it leave, how would it work, etc. So. Uh, so my Piketty has a, a very short article uh, uh, and, and talks uh, in, the, in a book uh, edited by Greta uh, Thunberg and talks also a bit in his uh, uh, brief history of inequality of something to you know, raise money from rich countries to poor countries. And he, that, his proposal is we should just give it to the poor countries and put it in the budget and no question asked. Uh, the issue, uh, when we combine with the fact that actually there is also a ton of inequality in both emission but also in the cost of uh, climate change within poor countries, is whether that would go to the poor citizen. So if we just put money in the Indian budget, are we sure that it goes to uh, some of the poorest citizens that are the most affected by climate change? So that's... So that's that, at one extreme, at the other extreme, and it seems that we are going toward this other extreme, the World Bank sets, gets it and administers it as a fund with very little input from the poor countries. Uh, uh, it has advantages because they, they have capacity to do it. And, but then uh, what the poor countries are really objecting is that this money is theirs in a the sense, uh, and now it's administered by, you know, in, in Washington, D.C., so that's not proper. And, there is a lot to say for that. So, oops. So, my uh, proposal there again for, and there I think there is also a lot of work to do. Uh, and maybe I should have done this work because maybe this is the place where I know just, uh, I would know a little more. But this is where I've done the least work is how. So, this is the three things where I would spend it if I had to think about it. One of it is uh, simply uh, uh, um, automatic transfers to households that are triggered by climate events. So today, many more people around the world are really connected to, uh, within like a phone app away or in India, uh, um, bank accounts uh, are reachable uh, by transfers. So... Uh, there could be rules that uh, the, when, you know, as a function of the situation in the, in the particular uh, sub-region, everyone is entitled to that, uh, to that transfer. Uh, there can even be rules. There is work uh, by uh, Stephen Derken and others looking at anticipatory transfer, transfer in Bangladesh, paying people before the, the event takes place which is, really helps people, you know, put themselves to safety. It helps with adaptation. So you don't comp compensate people. You compensate people in advance. It actually helps uh, uh, saving lives. So there is a lot. It's, it's, not, it's not true that everyone is ready to be paid for today. So there is a lot of work, just money to be spent to create the infrastructure. But it is feasible to have, basically, pipelines that uh, touch a lot of people. And we now have so much evidence that once people get money, they use it well. 
uh, that this kind of transfer, compensatory transfer when things are going poorly, uh, if possible in advance, would uh, be spo uh, both be compensation and adaptation. So that's, you could probably spend, unfortunately, quite a bit of money on that because there are a lot of these events. The second is energy access and leapfrogging. Uh, so again, I don't think mitigation should be shouldered by poor countries, but on the other hand, there is really no reason to, to, do, to, to build a, a charcoal plant. If you can do, uh, build a more expensive but plant that is going to leapfrog, create a good electricity grid and so on, do it with grants, not with loans. And the third, and that's where I'm preaching for my parish, going back to the debate, to the one question that was asked about the training, is there is so much we don't know. And we are just scratching the surface today with a great session about something that can be done. But the research on how a household can adapt uh, to climate change, uh, how they can contribute to mitigation at their own level, uh, or even how to adequately, it's just inf infant. <laughs> so I think that, so there have been something like development impact uh, venture at USAID or the FID in France have been, have shown great, great success in reaching multitudes of projects all around the world, really coming from the grassroots. So for example, the FID in France, most of the projects that have been proposed have been proposed from the grassroots in Africa, in regions that are very, uh, uh, affected by climate change. Let this project come from everywhere, uh, fund them, and, uh, uh, and learn from that what works for adaptation, mitigation, compensation, etc. Have uh, independent panels so that it's not like the same bureaucracy of the World Bank or whatever that is seen as making decisions. Try to distribute these panels around the world. That could be kind of the third thing you do with this money. Uh, so let me uh, conclude there. Uh, I think there may be a margin for action. Uh, stay tuned. <laughs> uh, it is also the case that it's not that I have an in to anybody who can make that happen. So uh, um, uh, part of my strategy is to jump up and down and ho hope that the message gets, uh, uh, gets uh, kind of relayed. And I know that uh, all of you are, are part of this. Uh, the, I think just putting this argument out, or that's my hope, might lead to even to other, you know, not, not necessarily these, but maybe other things uh, to be adopted because they kind of change a little bit the conversation between John Kerry saying there is no way we'll pay reparations to, okay, but what it is that we need to do. Thank you. So yeah, uh, welcome uh, Lucas back to the, the uh, panel here. And uh, basically, I have little to say. I think we have you know 15 or 20 minutes to question. So I'd like to just engage with the audience uh, and see what you'd like to ask about these great presentations. Yeah, Ken. Great, thank you very much for the very impressive presentations. And I appreciate the posing of a solution after a very sobering assessment of, of where we stand. My question relates to the, this is the, um, for uh, Professor Duflo, uh, on the 500 billion that you posed. So that was coming from the mortality costs uh, that are being imposed upon developing countries. But that 500 billion also depends on the value of statistical life that's assumed. And there are contentious arguments all the time about do we count someone in Ghana the same way as someone in the U.S. or much less, depending on, you know, scale it by their GDP. So I'm wondering whether that uh, opens a can of worms by tying it to the $500 billion to uh, a, something that is attached to a value of statistical life that may be very contentious among the people who would be receiving the funding. Do you have thoughts on this? Yeah, great question. So uh, there is that. And then on the other hand, you could say, but we know why stop at mortality? We should use the full uh, social cost of carbon, or at least the social, social cost of carbon as it uh, plays out in the poor countries. Um, and, and I think that maybe would be uh, Tamara's view or my, Michael Grinson's view. But um, I, I think it might be uh, the most helpful way to do this, and that's kind of why I, where I hope to go, is to choose your own adventure. 
you know, this is, this is, this is the emissions. You can even go production, consumption, the new, <laughs> the new and improved uh, consumption that uh, they are going to generate. And then this is the cost. This is, you know, $37 for uh, value of, uh, of a statistical life uh, uh, times the mortality damage, full social cost of carbon, undervalue uh, people in low-income country, which I wouldn't personally do, but, you know, someone might want to do. And that gives you a sense of where, uh, uh, how these numbers might, might play out. For the one thing that I hope to do is to kind of build this tool, uh, all of the data is already there to, uh, to do it, and it would help people uh, uh, form their... Uh, but at least they would have to argue uh, publicly that that's what they chose, and that, would, that itself would be interesting. Yes, Catherine? Uh, fascinating proposal. Thank you. I, I guess I, I'm more optimistic than you are about carbon pricing. I think, in particular, the EU CBAM is encouraging a lot of countries. Like just yesterday, Turkey announced that they're adopting carbon pricing. There are a bunch of countries, Thailand, Vietnam, Senegal, that, that are considering carbon pricing in response to the EU CBAM. And there have been bills in the U.S. that tie carbon price revenues to distributions to low-income countries. And I could imagine that that would make it more politically, you know, saleable in, in developing countries – or, sorry, um, richer countries that people might be – you know, I think, first of all, like, communicating the fact that carbon pricing raise revenue and then using that revenue for, for low-income countries could be something that, that makes it more politically tenable in, in rich countries. Yeah, I don't think that carbon pricing cannot be done. I think that they, they can, but I'm not sure that if you link carbon pricing to sending the money in poor countries, that would work out. In a country like, in France, for example, that wouldn't play out. It's like whatever. It, I, because people are so, you know, the poor people, they, f they feel so much hardship as it is, even though their hardship is not the same as people in Niger that, you know, they don't want, they are not concerned about future generations, they are not particularly concerned about people in Africa either if they have to pay for it. So, so I think carbon pricing, that's another discussion in a way, but I think carbon pricing can work if you can credibly commit that the incidence is not on the poor. And I think it has been difficult, f uh, but it's, it has worked in some cases. For example, Indonesia successfully removed a lot of sub subsidies to, it's not carbon pricing, but it's equivalent, when they tied it to an unconditional cash transfer. And I think there was enough trust that it just went through. Canada was able to do that as well. In the, at the same time, when France tried to do car impose this carbon tax, like just before they had removed the wealth tax. So the optic of it was, well, it's kind of a different discussion. I think carbon pricing are feasible, but they require... Uh, uh, a lot of trust and pedagogy. And I'm not sure that linking them to uh, poor countries would make it easier, but maybe. It just, I mean, you could read, so what, what's been proposed in bills in Congress is to like, link some of it, like, you know, 25% or something. Maybe, maybe to, to jump in here, um, so I fully agree with um, Esther that um, um, national carbon taxes um, would probably... Uh, uh, fail in so many countries if they were tied if their revenues were tied with uh, with uh, uh, increased spending or donations to the rest of the world but in the CBAM so uh, border adjustments uh, there were proposals actually in the EU that some of the revenues of the border would be used to compensate the losers because in that case the losers are outside basically right but that battle so far was lost so the EU decided to keep the funds uh, for within but I think this is going to be an ongoing debate as basically the rates or the implied rates increase at the border or the types of goods that are subject to, to this mechanism um, get enlarged. So I think the same principle that applies within countries that carbon pricing works when the losers are well compensated, CF British Columbia, for instance, uh, I think it also applies pretty well in the global stage so I think there is still scope for these discussions to be, to be pursued in Europe and in other, in other uh, regions and countries as well. 
Thank you. Very impressive uh, presentations. Thank you much indeed. Uh, my name is Chaba. I'm coming from the field of diplomatic struggles. Uh, you've uh, you've indicated a couple of times. A couple of questions that may help us uh, moving forward. Uh, first, uh, I understand that we basically we are talking about a global system of redist redistributing revenues and incomes. On national scales, we have the legal and institution system for that. We call it taxation and social policies. Do we have it on a global scale? And are we going to introduce it at global scale? The second, uh, you have mentioned that in the range of 530, 560 billion dollars might be raised, might be needed uh, to make a change, uh, which is about three times uh, of the size of the official OTA. Can you tell me one single country in the last 70 years that came out of poverty due to ODA? And uh, the, if, uh, if the tripling size would make a difference, how that would make the difference. And uh, the third one, I was very much interested in where do you see the sources uh, of these funds that would be globally redistributed? And you never mentioned uh, the petrol countries. Just in the last one and a half years, uh, the windfall profit uh, was much higher than anything else in the last 1,000 years in the, in the human history. Just Norway, during one and a half year, received extra windfall profit without investment, without, without any special investment. That would be in real terms, real prices today, much higher than the whole Marshall Plan offered by the US to the whole of Europe. And that is now is out of, out of our thinking. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Sure. So we, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'm just going to collect two or three questions and then allow the panelists um, to, to respond. Yeah, so Costas? Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was super illuminating, and the numbers for inequality in particular. The numbers for inequality. I find the numbers for getting out of, uh, you know, the carbon cost of getting people getting out of poverty kind of optimistic. Because if we think of the countries that, you know, grew fast out of property, like India, China, Vietnam, they went through a growth process that was much more messy, and the, the emissions increased massively. Also for general equilibrium reasons, right? Like, you know, you have to create policies that have many repercussions of how you grow, how you emit. <coughs> but if this, is, if this is a true critique, what I'm saying, then this has implication of how do you you know, what policies should you use? Because redistribution is not going to be enough. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Um, and I guess, uh, lastly, yeah, so Rohini, you want to? I had two rules. One, I had one question of my own, and then there was one on Zoom from actually a panelist who was in the afternoon, and she sent it from India, where she stayed up late, so I felt I should ask that. I think my question, which was a quick question, uh, is that this, poverty emissions trade-off, which I'm incredibly sympathetic to politically otherwise, my understanding is it doesn't account for changes in growth trajectories of these poor countries. And so you can imagine that if Niger suddenly starts growing at 20% or something like that based on fossil fuel-led development, you may see very, you may actually see a genuine trade-off. And I think that's the thing that people are posing is not so much that if you redistribute and build them up, how much they'll consume, but rather if that country really changes um, sort of its nature of growth. So I'd love to hear about that. And then this is from uh, Tejal, um, who's uh, in India. She's one of the IPCC authors in the panel in the afternoon. For Lucas, does the focus on income distributions across the world, as though we have one global community divided into three classes, not take away from the fact that these trends are still strongly mediated by nation states? How do we connect this inequality across different levels of development to nation states? And then to Esther, uh, why only focus on the, on the eradication of basic minimum of extreme poverty? The study quoted is often used to shut down arguments of climate justice. So maybe I could ask Lucas to respond first, and then Esther to take the several questions at once. 
Many thanks. Um, maybe on the first point on the um, carbon um, impact of poverty eradication. Um, so I think this this is a valid point. Um, Algat and co-authors have a paper on that, uh, basically saying that uh, you know after Bruckner uh, that actually it might be a little more carbon intensive. Although to to me the real challenge is uh, what happens after the you know five point five dollar poverty line. Uh, and, and still the point that, you know, below 1.9, uh, it's relatively little carbon. This point is, is to me, pretty, pretty strong. The question really is what happens, what trajectories, what growth trajectories, what consumption patterns are associated with the type of middle class or non-extreme poor life uh, we're talking about. And so that's very much uh, the issue here, but not the eradication of extreme poverty itself. And I think, yeah. As Esther was saying, we've been talking too much about this. Uh, the second point, uh, nation state versus uh, a global social state. Well, I think first, there are some elements of that, uh, you know, very, very preliminary, but the United Nations operates, you know, does some form of redistribution. And so that could also be one of the recipients of the funds that Esther was talking about. The second answer, I think, is really the Duflo strategy of trying to bypass uh, existing mechanism and create new ad hoc ones. So if you add up a layer of tax on the corporate minimum tax that is currently being negotiated, basically no one feels that they are losing from it except a few company uh, shareholders. But so basically you're, you're kind of... Um, uh, taming down the potential losers from such measures, but you're still generating new funds, and you can use them in different either ad hoc mechanisms in the UN, the World Bank, or whatever. But that's how I think we can progressively move beyond this uh, national versus international social state discussion. Yeah, maybe it's kind of uh, without doing justice for to all the comments. Um, so on this, I think your question causes very much this question, which is the thing is China and India became rich. A lot of people became rich. It's not just uh, <laughs> the people below. So when we do this calculation, is really literally what these people would consume. But what happened in China and India, they had a lot of very, very, very rich people also. And in fact, some of the highest polluters are in China and India now in terms of consumption emission. They have their billionaire and they live in... Uh, 50 uh, floors, uh, houses, and they have cars, and so on and so forth. So, so that's kind of, I think, the distinction between the two. Um, so you were wondering whether there is any precedent for international redistribution. There is. We have the UN, we have the IMF, we have the World Bank. There is, there, there is actually the Bretton Woods Institution are a mechanism for uh, global redistribution, not very big but uh, nonetheless <laughs> existing. That's why I was saying it's not uncom it's already in the system. There is pipes for sending money for funds to the World Bank, and uh, that, then that money goes to poor countries in the form of IDA. So the principles are not uh, unheard of. Uh, maybe the, the magnitudes are, are, are different, as you pointed out. Um, you, asked, you, you were asking if uh, anybody has proven that any country went out of poverty, uh, poverty with ODA. First of all, I don't think one can easily uh, prove that one way or the other, because it's not that we have a good counterfactual. Uh, second of all, uh, uh, ODA is way too small to take anybody, uh, any country out of poverty, so even this idea would be... You know, from, from richer countries, we tend to think we are so important, but in terms of the budget that goes toward poor people, people in the world, this is minuscule, so it's not going to take them out of poverty. If countries go out of poverty, it's because of what they do. Uh, and if they, or if something, if they manage to um, fight uh, the uh, problems that people uh, face in poor countries. So, um, so I kind of think that's sort of a, a non-question in this particular issue. And then going back, I think it's useful to represent this idea, this, this, this money, this 500 billion. It's, I don't think it's one thing that I am pretty convinced. It, there shouldn't be a counterpart that, oh, we give you this money, now you have to grow. It's not something that we would do out of the goodness of our heart. It's something that we owe whatever we can calculate how much we owe we can argue on the <laughs> we can bargain on the on on the details but it's not about oh i'm going to help you but then you have to show me you're a good student 
uh, that we owe that not so much to the countries, but to the people. And so the, the key difficulty is to make sure it reaches the people. Whether or not the country will grow as a result, frankly, I think it's besides the point for this particular proposal. Wonderful. I think we'll stop there and carry the conversation into lunch, but a warm uh, reception for our panelists. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>